wayfaring stranger I'm traveling through this world of war Yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger In that bright land to which I go I'm going there to see my mother She said she'd meet me when I come I'm only going over Jordan I'm only going January 23rd, 1855, right smack dab in the middle of the American Wild West. This is when our story begins. Ogden, Utah is where our story begins. John Moses Browning was one of 22 children. His father, Jonathan Browning, was a devout Mormon and a skilled gunsmith and blacksmith. Young John was inventive at an early age. When he was 10, John pieced together some parts in his father's blacksmithing shop to create an extremely rudimentary shotgun. John hewed a stock out of a chunk of scrap wood he dug from the discarded parts in his father's shop. He also used an old musket barrel and several feet of wire to construct the shotgun. There was no trigger on this shotgun. Instead, Browning used a hot stick to light gunpowder, which he had taken from his father without permission. He and his brother managed to kill three birds in their first and only outing with the gun. Food was a priority, and gunpowder was in short supply on the frontier. When Browning's dad found out about his escapades, he did not reprimand the boys, but told John, You're going on 11? Can't you make a better gun than that? At age 13, John Moses Browning designed his first fully functioning firearm in his father's gunsmithing shop. Browning went to school until he was 15, completing an 8th grade education. He went on multiple hunting adventures into the mountains near home during his late teens and early 20s. At age 24, Browning would receive his first of his total 128 patents. John sold his first patent to the Winchester Company for a sum of $8,000 in the year 1883. That translates to roughly $250,000. A salesman from the Winchester Company was down in Ogden, where Browning's shop was located, and he was so impressed with the workmanship that went into the gun that he bought the rights to the rifle that would become the 1855. While the engineer from Winchester was in Ogden, he found that John Moses Browning was working on his own concept for a large bore, hunting caliber lever action rifle. The Winchester Company was extremely interested in this, mainly because all the lever action rifles of the time were not strong enough to handle a hunting cartridge. They were instead made to shoot the far less powerful planking or pistol cartridges. John would go on to have a 19 year exclusive design relationship with the Winchester Company. John Moses Browning was interested in improving the existing patents on the lever-action rifles of the time. When Winchester visited him in 1885, they made a deal with him, right on the spot, to buy this new, large-caliber hunting rifle from Browning when he was finished developing it. He sold Winchester his patent for the 1874 rifle for $50,000. This translates today to a sum of $1.4 million. This Browning design really allowed rifle cartridges to be fired out of a lever-action design. Browning, being Browning, 
would iteratively improve upon this initial design, first in 1876 and then again in 1894. His improvements to this system were mainly safety improvements to allow larger cartridges to be fired more safely. The Winchester lever action rifle cultivated in the Model 1894 Winchester, which was an improvement Browning had designed based on his earlier 1876 model. The earlier lever action rifles had all worked on a similar system. When the lever underneath the gun was operated, a bar inside the rifle that almost looked like a knee joint would bend, allowing the bolt of the rifle to move backwards and cock the hammer. When you closed this lever, the knee joint inside the rifle would straighten out into a straight line, preparing the next cartridge to be fired. What Browning did to allow more powerful cartridges to be fired out of a lever action design was to have the lever down below the gun be linked to two different vertically traveling blocks. When the lever of the gun was moved forward, those vertically moving blocks would move down out of the path of the bolt, which would allow the bolt to move back and cock the hammer. When you would move the lever in towards yourself, the bolt would be moved forward pushing the next cartridge into the barrel. Once the cartridge was fully within the barrel, those two vertically traveling blocks would move back up and lock the bolt in place against the receiver. This was a much stronger system than all of the previous lever action designs, and this allowed full-size rifle cartridges to be used in these rifles. Today, we're taking a look at the Winchester Model 1894. The rifle was developed in 1894, as the name suggests, and it is basically an improvement over the mechanical system of the Winchester 1886 and 92. Browning, being John Browning, pondered this design and, after a couple years, came up with some ways to improve it. And that was the 94 Action. By 2006, when Winchester's New Haven factory shut down, they'd manufactured more than 7 million of these rifles, 70% of them in a single cartridge. This is by far the most popular Winchester rifle ever made. It is, in fact, the most popular centerfire sporting rifle ever made in the United States total. This is the Model 1894 lever action, and it's a modification of the Model 1886 that uh, John Browning designed. The way this firearm functions is the cartridges are put in through this loading gate on the side, and it will accept seven cartridges. To load the firearm for firing, you run the lever down this way, which unlocks this bolt here, and there's a cartridge lifter inside. It takes a cartridge out of the magazine and lifts it up so that it's in line with the breech. And it also cocks the hammer back. When you close it, it pushes the round into the breech and then the locking bolt comes up and locks the bolt in place and the firearm is now ready to fire. And you do that seven times and hopefully you get seven hits. John Moses Browning would bring a patent idea to Colt. Colt had been a long-running behemoth in the handgun market and military arms market for many years, and Colt's gamble on Browning's patent would pay off. Browning's original design was for a locked breech handgun. The only other majorly successful locked breech handgun at this point was the P08 Luger. What locked breech means is that when a cartridge is fired, there is a lot of pressure, around 21 to 30,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. Locked breech simply means that the breech end, or the end where the cartridge is loaded into the gun, is locked up and cannot move until the pressure has dropped enough so that the pressure is not liable to harm the user. Some pistols of this time period are blowback operated pistols. What this means is that the only thing that is delaying the opening of the pistol is the weight of the pistol and the return spring. This is generally an extremely simple operating mechanism, 
However, it has several downsides, including the weight of the gun and the inability to use high-pressure rounds. At this time period, most other military pistols were revolvers. Brownie realized that he could use the pressure expended from the firing of a bullet to cycle a gun, recock the hammer, and load the next round. Browning's original design for what would later be known as the 1911 started in the year 1900. Browning's original design for the pistol utilized a recoil operation. What this meant was that the pressure of the previous bullet firing would actually move the slide backwards. The barrel and the slide would move back together, because the barrel was locked into recesses in the slide. After the barrel had moved backward, the barrel would actually drop down. The first design by Browning would prove to be too finicky and too expensive for Colt to gain any large military contracts. Browning's later improvements to the 1911 pistol would mainly be the locking method. Unlike all of his earlier designs, the 1911 pistol kept the same method of locking the barrel into the slide and moving the barrel backwards with the slide upon firing. But now, Browning would introduce a much more simplified method of locking the barrel into the slide. Instead of using a method where the barrel would first retract backwards, and then move down, the 1911 would have a barrel that would tilt down at the breech end. This made for a much simpler and far more cost-effective pistol for Colt to manufacture. In March of 1911, the improved Colt automatic pistol was trialed by the U.S. military. The pistol went through rigorous military testing procedures with no malfunctions and no parts breakage. The U.S. military would adopt this pistol, and we would use this pistol throughout both World Wars, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. The 1911 design was so popular that it is still manufactured today, over 100 years after it was first designed. And even today, almost all pistols that you see on the shelves of gun stores utilize this same style of locking system. The gun actually has three safety systems on it. One is the grip safety. Without the grip safety depressed, even with the trigger pulled, the hammer won't fall. There's a half cock safety on it. At half cock, you pull the trigger, the gun will not fire. And there's a slide safety on it with a slide safety on it will not fire. So it actually has a triple safety system on it. Below the 1911, the, the slide is back and locked open. The magazine is inserted through the pistol grip. The slide is released, feeding around out of the magazine and into the chamber. The hammer is also cocked. When you pull the trigger, the hammer comes forward, hitting the firing pin, firing the round in the chamber, at which point the slide cycles back and unlocks uh, the, from the toggle on the inside of it, and then it returns forward, picking up another round out of the magazine and putting it in the chamber, and the gun is ready to fire again. Out of all the firearms John Browning designed, this was purportedly his favorite uh, design. And that's the 1911. determined that it would need its own machine gun that they could have produced domestically instead of depending on another country, like France, to import its own machine guns. The U.S. military held a major trial for machine guns in the spring of 1917, to which 14 different designs were submitted. One of these guns was the Browning M1917 machine gun. The Browning gun had won this trial by a long shot, and, after the initial endurance test of 20,000 rounds being fired, 
an additional 20,000 rounds was fired through the gun. Throughout the 40,000 round endurance test, Browning's design only had one malfunction. Later in World War I, when the US needed a machine gun to be put in its tanks, John Browning answered to this request by taking his previously designed 1917 machine gun and making it stronger to fire the massive 50 caliber round. Both the M1919 and the M1917 are recoil-operated guns. What this means is that upon firing, the bolt and the barrel remain locked together. The barrel then moves backwards, unlocking the bolt and allowing the gun to cycle and load a new cartridge. The 1919 machine gun was originally made to be put into tanks, however airplane-mounted versions and many portable ground guns would later be developed. This design was adopted by a number of countries, alongside the US selling many of these to Russia, the UK, France, and Spain. The Browning 1919 is actually still in service with the US military today, as a machine gun that is mounted on jeeps, aircrafts, armored personnel carriers, and in placed positions. There is no thought of replacing the M1919 today, because the US doesn't really need to. The gun works incredibly well for us in the role we have it in right now. And if it isn't broke, why fix it? This has been in ongoing standard U.S. military service longer than perhaps any other firearm still in service, uh, longer than any one that comes to mind. These were originally developed in 1918. The gun developed literally over 100 years ago, first adopted as of this filming 98 years ago, is still good enough to be in wide scale service. That is amazing. And it really is testament to John Browning's genius in firearms design. John Browning gets the message. He is America's premier machine gun designer, small arms designer in general, really. And what he does is he takes his model of 1917 30 caliber machine gun and scales it up to 50 caliber. The request is first made in April of 1918. The gun, the first real test firing is done in November of 1918. So barely a one year development time to get what would become the M2 from a concept to actual firing prototype. And that again is a sign really of the genius of John Browning, um, as well as the work of both the Colt and the Winchester companies who were instrumental in doing the cartridge development and also the gun prototyping to get this thing off the ground in a hurry. Uh, in fact, at one point, uh, a newspaper reporter asked John Browning about what went into the design of this gun, and he credited it to one drop of genius in a gallon of sweat. Let's go ahead and pull this apart right now, and I'll show you what the internals look like. The first step in disassembly is taking off the barrel. And the first step in taking off the barrel is to pull the charging handle back just a little bit. Then I can unscrew the barrel. This handle acts as a crank that I can use to unscrew it. If the barrel's cool, however, I can just crank it by hand, and then the barrel comes out. As they're laid out inside the gun, here are the three main components. We have the buffer body, the barrel extension, and the bolt. When you fire, uh, the bolt is going to try to move backward. And as it does, you can see that it's going to pull the accelerator lever with it, which is going to pull the barrel extension, and the barrel is threaded into the front here. So the barrel and barrel extension are a significant added mass that are going to have to move rearward before the cartridge case can be pulled out of the chamber. That's going to delay the gun's opening and uh, reduce chamber pressure when it does open. This is fundamentally a short recoil operated gun, and this accelerator lever gives it a little more delay on top of that. Then these two components are going to stop, and that is largely done through this buffer spring. Pull these two apart. This is a very clever design here. And we have our buffer spring in the back of the buffer body there. So that obviously is a big assist to the relatively small mainspring. The Browning M2, of course, remains in service today. Uh, from its early origins as a water-cooled gun to its mid midlife use as a fixed mount aircraft gun to its current use in the M2HB or heavy barrel configuration like this, uh, it is a tremendously long-serving, venerable, and incredibly effective firearm.
He was the most prolific firearms designer in American history, if not in world history. He wound up with having uh, more than 120 patents and he designed over 80 firearms in his lifetime. He actually died at work. He was at the bench working on the pistol and he started experiencing severe chest pains. So his son Val took him into his office and sat him down and they called a doctor. And John Browning looked at his son Val and he said, well, I wouldn't be surprised if I, I died. And he died. <laughs> Everybody thinks that Thomas Edison was the most prolific inventor there ever was, but in all actuality, Mr. Edison had a whole lot of people working for him to develop some of his thoughts and his designs. All John Moses Browning stuff came out of his own head, and with the help of his brother Matt, he was actually more of a prolific inventor than what Thomas Edison ever was, and he was also a great American. When I check in my load, there ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down, there ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound I'm gonna rise straight out the ground, there ain't no 